next two speakers are going to take things from a slightly different perspective. Well, I'm going to introduce the first lady to you, Claire Moynihan. She works at the Institute for Cancer Research. You're a medical sociologist. I've always wanted to meet one. <laughs> There's very few of them, well that explains why we haven't. Now, Claire's going to talk to us about masculinity, and I can't help but look around the room and feel there's not enough men here to hear this talk. But anyway, I'm sure we'll all get something out of it, so over to you. Thank you for inviting me. I feel very privileged. Um, I just want to say one or two things about myself before I start. Um, I'm
on supportive interventions for men, on illness behaviours, on the meaning of genetics for men at high risk of testicular and prostate cancer, and the ways in which they may, may agree to screen for the disease. I'm also interested in the way in which patients may <coughs> wish to communicate and to be communicated with by health personnel. My conceptual interests revolve around masculine theory, masculinity theory on the meaning of gender and its impact on disease and on the ways in which language impinges on people's responses. I'll be talking about gender and how it differs from talking about men and women. I want to show you how men seem to reenact and react to treatments, how they constantly reinvent themselves as masculine in a hospital setting and outside it too, but heavily depending on context. I will implicitly, if not explicitly, talk about quantitative and qualitative methods and how they impact on men's responses. I will also be invoking the way that the Institute of Medicine itself may impinge on patients' responses, and I hope there will be time for discussion. Please ask me if, if you get into a muddle, put your hand up and say I don't understand what you're talking about. And I dare say I wouldn't be able to answer, but I'll try. <laughs> the quotes I use come from men between the average ages of 57 and 67, taken from my own and others' work, especially the qualitative work of John Olive, who is an Australian working in Canada. He's a, a senior nurse and he has produced some extremely interesting research regarding men with prostate cancer, and I am deeply indebted to him. I don't know whether you have read his work. Can you put up your hands if you've heard of him? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in medicine, and even psychoonology, men are perceived as a homogenous group. Such research that has been carried out depict men and women as different, the underlying premise assumes an essentialist stance. Men and women have certain traits. These traits are static, predictive, without ambiguity. The essentialist man rests on what we call hegemonic masculinity. That is an idealized form of masculinity, exemplified by David here. By hegemonic, we mean the perfection lies in the fact that he is white, middle class, heterosexual, muscular, youthful, strong, <coughs> successful, competitive, and purposeful. That he has the body of the worker. You see that, that David is holding something over his shoulder, and I think it's a sack in order to go to work. Certainly he's not being a father Christmas. And <laughs> he has the body of the worker, the body of David, and he differs from women. <coughs> I just want to read this quote out from a man called Losa. The postures, tensions, and texture of the muscular body are one of the main ways in which the power of men is seen as the order of nature. A man's presence, fabricated or real, is dependent on the promise of power he embodies <coughs> through his body. I just want to remind you of David again. <laughs> male characteristics including domination, aggressiveness, competitiveness, sexual and athletic prowess, control, and stoic emotional display are pervasive, as is the notion that women are the opposite. Men signify authority and leadership, constructed in relation to various subordinate masculinities, as well as in relation to women. What I'm saying there is that men will change according to who they're with. Not only is the idealized male body, the hegemonic body, sexual and disciplined to signify control and power, but in the public sphere, male bodies are expected to look and operate in specific ways. In our case, the public sphere is the hospital, where all these idealized male attributes play their way through medical training and the hospital ethos in general, affecting both male and female clinicians alike. In the medical mind's eye, men present themselves in the ways that I have described, and although they are sick, 
The solution is to repair that sick body and send it off on its way to resume its God-given status, that is, hegemonic masculinity, the idealised form of manhood described through our friend David. However, David stands alone, apparently. Where is his family? He differs from women, but does he really? He aspires to phallocentric sex without any notion of sexuality. I don't know, it might be a bit unfair on David, because perhaps he was very tuned into his sexuality, but when we look at that body, we think of phallocentric sex, I think. I think I think. <laughs> slides will demonstrate the ways in men may differ in pictorial form. Men can be young and black. He can be middle-aged and ruggedly white. Men can be old and lonely. Men can be young kings if they've oh, gone too far. Wait a minute. Yes. Men can be young and have lots of friends. Men can be young kings if they're lucky enough. <laughs> They can also be old queens, too. <laughs> they can be men who actually become women, like the beauty on the left. That beauty on the left was a man. They can be also be women who look like men, as depicted in the picture on the right. They can be women who try to look androgynous, as you see in this picture of a very famous fashion model. They may be rich or poor, straight or gay. There are huge differences between men. So, a single masculinity is contested as the concept becomes dynamic and contradictory, based on different cultures and periods of history that construct gender in various ways. Moreover, research has shown that men are more similar to women than we think. Interestingly, this kind of work is not interesting to people. Um, the dusty, essentialist assumptions weave their way from one generation to, the, to another. It's in the genes, we say. And I say, I don't think it is, I think it's in the mind. Okay. Now, not only do men differ in terms of social class, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, and other factors, but we need to have clues as to why masculine ideals appear to hold sway in our thinking about men and men's own responses to the latter. Theories, then, are used to help us to understand and to interpret those responses. I don't know what I would do without theory, and oddly enough, in psychology, theory is very seldom used, but sociologists, if we do one thing that's right, we try to look at theory. I want to talk about three theories regarding men and women. They are role theory, embodiment theory, and relational theory. In other words, a social constructivist theory. I am particularly interested in the second and third. Let's look at role theory first. This is an old, tried and badly tested way of looking at men and women. And while obsolete, it is still used to explain men, male action. We all know that it's rubbish, really, but we go on using it. You will probably be familiar with the ways in which it is said that he was always aggressive and competitive, even when he was a little boy, socialised to play with cars and guns, while his sister was yielding and sweet, and socialised to play with dogs. While this interpreta interpretation is changing, but very, very slowly, men with a life-threatening disease who do not seek help or fail to show emotion are thought of as just men, with their innate traits, while women are perceived in opposite ways. This may account for the fact that women, and not men, have been researched in the realms of psychological and psychosocial investigation. Indeed, women with cancer have been over-researched, I would say, to the extent that we have medicalised them. But the belief that men will not want to be involved in psychosocial matters is very pervasive, causing a dearth of information about their needs. We can begin to see how we ourselves, as health workers, may affect the status of men who are ill. So, it's been established that this is a theory of the past, however it continues to be used. It is dangerous. It implies complementary roles. It depicts men here and women here, two fixed, static and mutually exclusive role containers. It fosters the notion of a singular male and female personality within eight psychological needs, and it obscures the various forms of masculinity and femininity that women and men can and do demonstrate and even share. 
This theory contentiously turns to the organic foundations of human activity. It goes back to essentialism, to the importance of the human body in understanding social action and social interaction. This stance has been theoretically important because, as Olaf, my hero, points out, David's not my only hero, points out in his paper, Embodied Masculinity and Androgen Deprivation Therapy, it has helped to recast people's thinking about the status of the body in analysis of gender. The importance of the body is without question fundamental in our thinking about men with prostate cancer, or indeed cancer of any kind. The challenge remains, however, as to how to introduce biology in non-reductionist terms and move towards a more integrative phase of social theorizing. Chappell and Zeebland, in their paper Prostate Cancer, Embodied Experience and Perceptions of Masculinity, suggests that gender, being a man, is affected by hormones and therefore essentialism subtly affects the ways men and women react to each other and the ways in which gendered roles play out. When a man becomes ill, his body withered, it is not difficult to imagine the impact of loss. Loss of the man he was and the way in which he has, to some degree at least, become dependent, passive, vulnerable. Now, I have to confess that I'm an out-and-out -out social constructivist, or in other words, I rely on a relational approach while I accept that we integrate an embodied stance that I have just spoken about. Remember that you can always use more than one theory when you're, you're doing your research or looking at your work or thinking about what, a man, um, what it means to be a man with prostate cancer. From this relational constructive perspective, men and women think and act in the ways that they do, not because of their role identities or psychological traits, or indeed their bodies, but because of concepts about femininity and masculinity that are adopted from that, their particular cultures, and which you've seen in the earlier slide. Gender is therefore not two static categories, man or woman, but rather a set of socially constructed relationships which are produced and reproduced through people's actions. Gender is then not something that one is, but what one does or achieves over and over again in interaction, and others in ways that rely on context, in social transactions defined as gendered. Let me give you a simple example. Men can hug each other and cry on a football pitch, but are in general seen to be stoical, brave, fighting their cancer in a hospital setting, just like middle-aged Andrew on the left of the screen. He looks so sad, he looks terribly worried. What is he thinking? He reminds me of the man with prostate cancer and who was in one of Olive's samples who said that he was doing a crossword puzzle in his hospital bed and came to the clue, impotency. Well, the answer was powerlessness. We have to remember that men can be heavyweight champions in life, for example, but unable to hold a spoon in illness. They can tell the doctor they are fine while holding teddy bears under the sheets, which is how actually one of them <coughs> described their plight. They can blubber in cars away from the hospital context while remaining stoical on the hospital ward. Working class men may feel subordinate when talking with a bow tie professor of medicine and quite happy when talking to a young nurse. Not always, but sometimes. Sharma's in the paper Identity Dilemmas of Chronically Ill Men says illness can reduce a man's status in masculine hierarchies, shift his power relations with, relations with women and other men, and raise his self doubts about masculinity. One can imagine how it may feel to be faced with male personnel who are usually young and virile, all of whom, women too, are encased in an ethos of success, middle-classness, competitiveness, competitiveness and stoicism. We can begin to think how medical institutions may impinge on sick people and it's important to address our own practices, to be reflexive and mindful about every little thing we do, how we communicate, how we handle sick people, and how our actions can have profound and far-reaching effects on both men and women who are ill, as well as their families. Okay, so the critique of a relationship, it's always a critique, the critique of the relationship, of the relational approach, or constructivist approach, obscures the subjective in favor of the social. 
I suppose it's obvious that I would like this approach because I am a sociologist and I'm interested in the social. It also obscures the importance of the body, but I'm willing to let the body back in again. Okay. I now turn to some of the research that has been carried out with men with prostate cancer. As you will see later, I've divided advanced and early stage cancer. While life outcomes are similar, especially in the case of men treated with hormone therapy, there are some qualitative differences between the two, notably when radical prostatectomy has been, been performed on early stage patients. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say to you now, I think you know already, but nevertheless, as much as for myself, I'm going to, I'm going to show you. We start with the effects of advanced disease on masculinity. However, I want to start by talking about men who have not yet been diagnosed. This has been carried out regarding early diagnostic interventions. This quote comes from work we did that was actually investigating screening for high-risk patients. We wanted to know whether this and other men would advise their sons to go for prostate screening. screening. He was loath to for the reasons you see here. By and large, DRE generated vociferous reactions. This man was self-loathing, shameful, as a result of the digital examination. His pain is hidden, and this is backed by Bendelow's, Gillian Bendelow's work, that shows that pain is gendered, men are stoic, silent in this context, and interestingly, treated differently from women by medics. Moreover, this man is demonstrating a homophobic reaction. It is as if an acceptance of medical interventions such as the DRE may whitewash his sense of hegemonic masculinity, but he can't say it in the, in the context of hospital life. Where does it leave this man? Okay, so now we come to um, uh, quantitative results. This slide shows you how ADT affects men, but caution is needed when interpreting results. For example, quantitative methods represents the needs of service providers. It is not patient-centered. Numbers of very well ill men have fallen out of prospective studies. Thus, outcomes represent those of relatively healthy men and differing measures are used, offering very, very differing results. In any case, as we've heard this, um, earlier this morning, adjuvant hormone therapy is known to be the biggest predictor of dysfunction and quality of life. And as you all probably know, men treated with hormone experience pain, hormone therapy experience pain, fatigue, um, or tiredness, should I say, urinary and bowel problems, emotional distress, changes in social and role functioning and sexual functioning. <laughs> By and large, we are told that men's physical functioning returns to normal over a year, but as I indicated, differing measures produce differing results. There is, however, one aspect of men's experience that is more detailed than others, namely their sexual activity. Sometimes I think that there's absolutely nothing else in, in people's minds when we look at prostate cancer, but for the sex, but anyway, here we go. Okay, so the word castration is often used by service providers, as we heard this morning. What does this mean to men? We already know a little bit about what it means to men, and I'm going to talk about this later a little bit. We are told that men taking hormones experience a diminished sexual life because of loss of libido, impotence, reduced penis and testis size, muscle wasting and increased body fat, weight gain leading to dieting, diminished concentration, labor mood, hot flushes and fatigue. This is a very busy slide, but its most interesting aspect is the reference that shows that although depression in this group is high, only 2% of men are referred to psychologists or psychiatrists. Maybe that's a good thing, actually, but anyway. We have, to ask, we have to ask why. Is it because men will not disclose their distress to doctors? Or is it that doctors cannot believe that the stoical man does not experience distress? And if he does, he certainly does not want it addressed. Secondly, it's interesting that the younger men experience more distress regardless of treatment. Are they more able to talk about their pain than older men? Are they having a worrying time at work compared to men who are retired and possibly more financially secure? Excuse me. Do they worry more about their sex lives? Or has more notice been taken because of their relative youth, making it easier to voice their concerns? These are all questions that need to be answered. So quantitative methods have shown us that men receiving ADT, or adjuvant hormone therapy, are likely to have distressing side effects, including emotional dysfunction, 
and that doctors do not seem to refer them for help. Be that as it may, what does all this mean to men? How do men express their sense of masculinity and even possibly reformulate it in the context of illness and according to who they are interacting with and where? How do men respond to the side effects that on the face of it sound distressing in themselves, not to mention what impact they may be having on their sense of masculinity? Before we go for it further, I want to show you how men often talk and if not, think about their cancer, and I think it epitomizes the masculine stance. This 60-year-old white heterosexual patient wanted to control what was happening to him. He had watched videos of the operation he was to have, including biopsy. He had taken exercise to enable better recovery. He listened to doctors' very expert opinions as he extolled the scientific enterprise. His language indicates the ways in which he approaches his illness as he speaks about war. And as this man talks about winning, he separates himself from the here and now, shielding himself from the pain of facing a life-threatening disease while maintaining a strong, competitive, assertive and brave stance. Okay. So we know through qualitative work um, Wait, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. This is the effect of advanced disease, yes. We have an atypical body that becomes at the site of transition. Changes create uncertainty, surprise, and disquiet. Breasts are experienced as feminizing. Gender duality sets in a betwixt and between identity. I don't know, I'm sure you probably talk to more patients than I have, but I get the sense that they don't know who they are quite. Body image problems set in, hot flushes are associated with female menopause work, sex, competitiveness are sidelined, threatening roles and relationships. Okay, so before I go on to show the ways in which men talk about their plight in this context, I want again to linger for just a moment on language. The umbrella under which all care is given and received, take the word castration, which we've heard a lot about today. This man complains about the word castration, not surprisingly, for it conjures up all kinds of morbid connotations. We think of it as an emasculation of men, a weakening, rendering powerlessness, feebleness, helplessness, the ineffectual, no balls man. What must it feel to be made to be taken, to take on all or some of those symbols? How do men achieve a sense of themselves in the light of such devastation? <coughs> Men tend to talk about themselves in the context of their own cultures and social class groupings, but always intersected with masculinity. This man in his mid-60s speaks about his muscular working class body, explaining his status as a real truck driver. This, is, this demands muscle and strength, which is no, a normal masculine body, and how it was proved. However, this man's image of himself is of a feminized torso, his present body is not a true representation of his old one, its history or its achievements. This quote comes from a man in his 60s and indicates the labor mood that, he often that often accompanies ADT. It speaks clearly to a lost sense of rationality, to what Seidler calls the power, control, and strength of the masculine mind. I know that some of you might be thinking, help us if their masculine mind being rational. I'm saying it's not what is, but what we think it is, okay? And I don't mean to be rude about men either. But rather than this man's prostate cancer creating emotions of sadness, loss, anger, and vulnerability, these changes are consistently attributed to hormones, not helped by a nurse who was heard to say to her patient that it was women's revenge on man. Interestingly, when men speak in these terms, they invariably resort to masculine ideals expressed through fortitude, survivorship, and stoicism, using language like the man who said he could fight and win. As many theorists have pointed out, the penis and testis are important male signifiers. Many patients complain that as a result of ADT, their genitals reduce in size. What is worrying is that participants in Olive's study and in others were not aware of this potential side effect before their treatment started. You see that actually in quite a lot of the literature. Many patients rationalise this effect as a byproduct of hormone treatment and or surgery. 
but almost all are surprised and anxious and uncertain about the appropriateness of revealing the changes to their doctor. However, this man was able to tell his sons, and this highlights the way in which masculinities differ according to a relational context. It also highlights one of the many ways in which hegemonic or idealised masculinist messages are transmitted to young boys. Olive points to the ways that older age and illness partially erode some gendered performances such as penetrative sex. But participants perceive the curtailment of gender performance as a result of ADT, severing connections to hegemonic masculinity nevertheless. This enabled them to interpret functional alterations as a fait accompli, alterations that are scientifically driven, which in and of itself provided a masculine positivist way of rationalizing the inevitability of change. It's almost as if it's taken away from themselves and science is on their side. Science has created um, this state that they're going through. Only found that masculinity continued to be constructed in interactions as other gendered performances were taken up in line with the social limits inherent to older age and illness. This in the next slide illustrates the way that men may resort to men's masculine roles. One man says, I feel most like a man when I'm with my partner because I can protect her, I can love her, I can be her escort. So he's bringing back his masculine self. I feel most like a man when I'm working. I definitely feel fully male there. I to now turn to localised disease. Um, quantitative work, um, for instance, this study conducted by Litwin, who's quite a famous um, doctor, shows optimistically, I think, the ways in which almost all men retrieve their general health after one year post-radical prostatectomy. However, this slide shows that things are not as simple as they seem. Black Caribbean men were less likely than white men to return to all aspects of well-being. Why should this be the case? In the case of the former, perhaps the values of that group differed. Perhaps sexual prowess was more important than it might be for some white men, for example. Importantly, could it have been the case that these men felt themselves to be subordinate in the context of clinical practice? That clinicians, in good faith, spoke down to the lesser man, revealing possibly the ways that gender is played out between hierarchies of men, and indicating that ethnicity, culture, social class may all play their part in the construction of masculine and tease. An unmarried man um, did not fare, unmarried men did not fare well as well as married men. Again, why should that have been the case? Perhaps married men are cushioned by the support of their wives. What about homosexual men and, how, and men who live alone? How do these factors, such as socioeconomic status, affect response? The two studies here also reveal that health-related quality of life declined immediately after treatment for one year, when it returned to its pre-treatment level, but we are left without knowing the meaning of surgery in ADT and how that impinged on gender. What we do know is that men with early stage disease and who are treated with radical prostatectomy and or ADT suffer fatigue, urinary function is depleted as is bowel function. Men suffer pain and emotional problems and sexual function is sometimes heavily impaired. Here we get a glimpse of the ways in which these problems impact on men. For example, 90% of men who had undergone surgery are shown to resort to incontinence pads. Bowel problems are also evident. 30% experience pain that is linked to depression. Almost all complain of fatigue for at least six months, and younger men are more anxious than older ones, regardless of stage and treatment regimes. Most dysfunction is exhibited in men's sexual function, especially in terms of potency. Hence, one of the most significant aspects of idealized or hegemonic masculinity is impaired. Now, summary of quantitative methods shows us that most problems lie in the sexual arena when men are treated with prostatectomy, and this will vary according to age, quality, and length of relationships. What does all this mean? Many men are focused on surviving in the early days of their disease, and many patients will hang their impotence on the inevitability of the side effects of old age. However, men also claim that while their libido is intact, their erect erectile function is lost. Remember that it has been well established by theorists that <coughs> allocentric 
construction of sex is based on erection, penetration and climax, and is synonymous with hegemonic masculinity. In this slide, we are reminded of the ways in which men are pressured to adhere to a dominant culture. Others, of course, are especially those who, are, and especially those who are receiving ADT, explained that because of their lost libido, their impotency was of no importance, revealing at the same time that their preference was for medication over surgical castration because of its transitory nature and the way that the, 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 the latter is described. <coughs> While men do attempt to recreate phallocentric sex through the use of aids such as by Viagra, many men have recounted the failures of such procedures. One man said to Olive, we didn't know how difficult the alternative was going to be. The artificial just wasn't worth it. It had to be natural or not at all. We are probably better mates than lovers. We get on really well together. This slide illustrates the way in which some men accept their loss of sexual desire and the impotency, impotency that can follow from prostatectomy, ascribing it to old age. Intimacy takes over from phallocentric sex, suggesting that there is a diversity in how we define positions of masculinity, sexuality, and intimacy are achieved. Here we see other evidence that suggests that men are willing to accept their loss of libido and impotence as a result of advanced age. Some men are shown to hark back to their days when virility was synonymous with youth and closer associ associations could be made with hegemonic masculinity. But see how one of these men reinstates these good old days by saying that he had many women, he had sown lots of wild oats. Then there is the man who takes his sexlessness on the chin, ascribing it to science as he finds a way of reinstating his masculinity in giving advice, and I'll talk about that later. Lastly, the man who tells us that his wife is not too interested anyway, but as be that as it may, he turns to a way of excusing his powerlessness, his lost masculinity, while reinstating a subordinate one when he says he can't talk to other men, especially doctors. If we have the man, uh, here we have the man who echoes many others in his inability to, to disclose his tribulations to other men. Although he can speak about his incontinence and other things to women, we, ask, we have to ask why should this be the case? Here is another instance of the way in which men deal with the side effects of treatment that contrast with hegemonic idealized masculinity. This man's stoical attitude gets him through, however, as he re reinstates his old managing self. He says, I can manage as I've always done. The majority <coughs> of men speak about the ways in which their relationship with the attending physician is of paramount importance. This leads us to think about attachment theory and the way that even grown men, when ill, may wish to have a relationship that goes beyond good communication in the face of bad news and information giving. It also reinvents a sense of masculinity as men face experts on their own terms. Some men attend support groups, but the literature indicates that the motives in this context hang on advice giving and receiving rather than emotional talk. Last and not least, women are known to be more anxious than their sick husbands, and very little work has been carried out in this, on this factor. Now why should that be the case, I wonder? <coughs> the next two slides re reiterate what I've just said. Here, the activist reinstates his masculinity as he busies himself, courageous, proactive, and facing survivorship. As he says, I'm actively involved with others in helping. I'm doing a weekend course, trying to get media attention for prostate cancer, and making myself available to speak publicly at various forums, lobbying politicians. I know women do that too, actually, but um, in this case, you can see that he's, he's trying to reinvent himself as somebody who is useful. Mm -hmm. I feel great giving advice in a group, none of that emotional stuff. And that, that comes through in, in research work. I look up scientific research and tell them all it makes me feel useful, as if I was doing a job of work, worthwhile work, like that. Now work is a very, very um, significant um, attribute of men's sense of masculinity. Okay, so hegemonic versions of masculinity are had, um, uh, adhered to, but masculinities are relational. Um, we need more work of, um, uh, on older men. This is a, a lot, I mean these men are older, but they're not really old. 
Some men's sense of masculinity are profoundly affected by impotency, incontinence, etc. Others reformulate masculinity to fit masculine ideals depending on context. Always take into account that social class, ethnicity, sexual orientation may mean different responses and create multiple masculinities. And you know, men can be one thing and another at the very same time. Um, I remember when I was doing my work with testicular cancer patients, they told me, not just one man, that the doctor would come to his bed and he'd say, how are you, old chap? And he'd say, oh, I'm doing fine. And he'd be holding his teddy bear under his, under his sheet. Men require cl clinicians. They like talking to doctors. I'm sure they like to, talking to nurses too, but they, uh, when you talk about counselling, it's a no-go area. Um, by and large, I'm not saying everybody, but by and large, but it's doctors that they like talking to. And uh, what I say is that we must all listen to them, be reflexive in how we talk, how we listen, actually. Remember that everything we say and do will have an effect on that man, and vice versa. And it's imperative that we know all about these things for further interventions. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking lecture. I think I probably saw most of me at some point in your lecture. <laughs> um, now, we have run on in terms of time. Not a problem, as we started late. But we have got an hour and a half for lunch, and I thought we would have the next talk run on. So, Lisa, please, rather than take questions at this point, will you be around over lunch to talk to people? Claire, that would be good. Uh, sorry, you want to say something, Sarah? A comment, please do. Um, Sarah Porch, Head of Services at the Prostate Cancer Charity. One thing I've observed over the last two and a half years with men with prostate cancer is how cruel it is that it's a disease of older age. If you're diagnosed with cancer, you have treatments that affect your sexual function and sense of masculinity that way. And what we find with an awful lot of men is the third whammy of retirement and the loss of work all come together yes. and so it's a real threat to somebody's identity. Yes. They're, they're, they're going through that loss without prostate cancer. Yes. I, it's a huge, huge thing. Very, very complex. It is complex. It's interesting as well because whether retirement will be something that you would consider a threat or, a well, or an opportunity. The loss of work and that adjustment yes. of identity. It's a good comment. Any other quick comments for Claire? I am keen that we move on.